In part one, we learned what a suspension roll center is and how to find it using two different methods. In part two, we're now going to talk about why we even care about them. What do they do for us and how do they affect the way the vehicle behaves? Hello everyone, I'm Hubert Mace. Welcome to the Complete Guide to Suspension Roll Centers. This is Suspensions Explained. There are three main reasons why we care about suspension roll centers. They are jacking, ride, and body roll. Let's talk about each one of those individually, starting with jacking. In part one of this series, we learned that while we'd like to know where the instant center of the suspension motion is, what we are really after is the line from the instant center to the contact patch, a line which we'll call the roll center line. In fact, the second method that we learned didn't even use the suspension instant center. We derived the roll center line directly from the motion of the tire contact patch. Now we will see why we really only care about this line and not necessarily the instant center of the suspension. Let's look at this on a piece of paper so we can draw some forces. Let's use the double wishbone design from part one to illustrate the concept of jacking. When we know where the instant center of the suspension is, we can think of the entire suspension being reduced to a single link pivoting about that point. Something like this rod here, pivoting about the instant center and attached rigidly to the knuckle at the other end. As the suspension moves up and down, it basically just pivots about the instant center and the suspension moves about that center. As the suspension moves up and down, it pivots around the instant center. And so the motion of the knuckle is basically in a circle around that point. Now, it doesn't matter where we attach our imaginary rod to the knuckle. The motion of the knuckle will always be the same, it will always be centered around the instant center. We could attach it here where the upper control arm is, or we could attach it down here where the lower control arm is. In either case, the motion of the knuckle doesn't change. In fact, we could even think of this link as being attached to the knuckle down here at the contact patch. Clearly that's not physically possible, but it's an imaginary link. So we can attach it wherever we want. If it's attached here at the contact patch, the motion of the knuckle will still be the same. It will still be centered around this instant center. Now, imagining the link being from the instant center to the contact patch does make the concept of jacking a little easier to understand. When a vehicle is in a corner, imagine this vehicle being in a left-hand turn, so it's turning to the left. The cornering force on the outside tire would be inboard, something like this. Let's call that force of cornering. If we imagine our suspension being a single link like this, then the cornering force will push against the bottom of this link. Now the other link here, this imaginary link will be attached to the body here. The body is pushing back against the link at this point. Notice that because these forces are at different heights, what will happen is if you push hard enough, that link will want to stand up. And the height of the instant center and thereby the angle of this link will determine how much the tendency is for the link to stand up. If we had an instant center that was up here, for instance, instead of down there, now this link is sitting at this kind of an angle. Clearly, if you have a cornering force, it's going to want to make this link stand up a lot more easily than if we're down here at our actual roll center. Conversely, if the roll center is actually here down on the ground, now our link will be horizontal and the two forces will be directly in line with each other and the link won't want to move at all. This tendency of the link to want to stand up is called the jacking force. And since the end over here by the tire is constrained to the ground, the only thing that the jacking force can do is lift the body. And that's exactly what it does. Now, the formula for figuring out how strong the jacking force is, is the following. The force of jacking is equal to the force of cornering times the sine 
of the angle between the instant center line and the ground. As you can see, as this angle gets bigger, this sine times sine of theta term also gets bigger and the jacking force gets bigger. As this angle gets smaller and slowly approaches zero, this sine theta term also approaches zero until eventually the jacking force becomes zero. One thing to notice about this formula is that the only terms that come into it are the cornering force and the angle of the roll center line. This formula does not care where this instant center is along that line. It does not care whether we have a long imaginary link or whether we have a short imaginary link. It doesn't matter where along this line the instant center actually lies. The only thing that matters is that angle theta. This is why the second method that we came up with in part one to find the roll center line works because the only thing that really matters is that angle. Now, as we mentioned before, the higher the roll center gets, the more angle there is on our roll center line, the stronger that jacking force is going to be. A very good example of this are the early swing axle cars like the Triumph Spitfire and the Volkswagen Beetle. Look at this picture here of a Spitfire. The rear wheels are tucked way under the car and the body has been jacked way up. Doesn't look very stable, does it? In fact, it would get so bad in some of these cars that even when the driver straightened out the wheels, the suspension wouldn't go back down and the car was stuck on the side of the road until a tow truck came around. Let's take a look at a model of a swing axle suspension so we can see how the tire moves. Here we have a model of a rear suspension. We have the swing axles here with the inner CV joints. These axles are rigidly connected to the knuckle and we have a tension link here to help keep things in control. This big box here represents the rest of the body of the car. You can see here how the suspension moves up and down and how the knuckle and the wheel is rigidly attached to the swing axle and how the change in camber angle is very severe as the tire moves up and down. Let's look at this in the rear view so you can really see how much the angle of the tire is changing. You can see how severe the angle change of the tires is. Now let's look at the roll center lines for this suspension design. We know that the instant center of the suspension motion is the center of these inner CV joints. So really all we have to do now is draw a line from the center of this joint down to the contact pad, something like this. Notice that the roll center of this suspension design, which is the intersection of the two roll center lines here, is very, very high, much higher than we saw in the previous designs in part one. Now let's look at what that means for our jacking forces. If we go back to our analogy of reducing the suspension to a single link from the instant center to the contact patch, we would have a link that is pivoted here at the instant center in the inner CV joint and going down to the contact patch. You can see that if I apply a cornering force to this link, it really wants to stand up due to the severe angle between the roll center line and the ground. And that's exactly what you see in vehicles that had this suspension. The cornering force resulted in a very high jacking force and caused the wheels to tuck up underneath the body and raise the body. And that's exactly what you saw in the picture of that Spitfire, where the tires had really tucked up under the body and pushed the body way up in the air. You can see why this suspension design didn't last very long and why you don't see it anywhere today. Now, if we go back to our previous diagram, there's something happening here that we need to talk about that many people forget about when talking about jacking forces. And that is that while we have a cornering force on the outside tire that's causing our jacking force, we also have a cornering force on the inside tire that is pushing the inside tire inboard towards the center of the turn. Now this force is pulling on the opposite instant center and because the force is now in the outboard direction on this tire, what it's doing is it's trying to pull this instant center down. So there's actually an anti-jacking force being generated by the inside tire in a turn at the same time that there is a jacking force being generated by the outside tire in a turn. And this force acts through the angle, let's call this angle alpha, 
So the anti-jacking force is going to equal the force on the inside tire. Let's call this the force inside. Force on the inside tire times the sine, the angle. Unfortunately, the outside tire force is always going to be greater than the inside cornering force due to the weight transfer that happens during cornering. The outside tire effectively gets heavier due to the weight transfer, so they do more of the cornering work. This means that while the lowering force from the inside tire is certainly there, it is never enough to completely overcome the jacking force from the outside tire. But there's another factor that we need to consider, and that is what's happening to the roll center when the body of the vehicle rolls in a corner. Let's have a look at that. Here we see an image of a body that has rolled in a turn. Imagine we're looking from the back at this vehicle, making a left-hand turn, so the body has rolled to the right. Again, we have our outside cornering force acting on the outside tire, and we have the inside cornering force acting inside tire. Notice, however, that the two roll center lines are not mirror images of each other now. The roll center, which is the intersection of the two roll center lines, has actually moved. And it has moved inward towards the center of the vehicle, like we saw in one. What this means now is that the angle here, which was theta, and the angle here, alpha, not the same. In fact, the angle on the inside tire is greater than the angle on the outside, which means that in our previous formula, the sine of theta is going to be smaller than the sine of alpha. Remember the formulas that we had for figuring out the jacking and the anti-jacking. The jacking force was the cornering force times the sine of the angle theta, whereas the anti-jacking force was the force on the inside times the sine of alpha. But now since alpha is larger than theta, the sine of alpha term will be larger than the sine of theta term, and this will help increase the anti-jacking force, whereas the smaller angle theta decreases the jacking force. The reality though is that while the migration of the roll center helps us, it is not enough to overcome the jacking force because the cornering force is so much greater than the force on the inside. This shows why it is so important for suspension engineers to fully understand how the roll center moves as the suspension moves. And it also shows why letting the body roll a bit in cornering is not really such a bad thing. Making the car overly stiff in cornering may make it feel like it's cornering better, but you may actually be making this jacking issue worse by eliminating the beneficial effect of the roll center migration. Now, everything we've been talking about so far only applies to independent suspensions. With a live axle, the wheels on opposite sides of the car are rigidly connected to each other, so there's no way for the wheels to tuck up under the vehicle and raise the vehicle up. The result is there is no jacking force in a live axle vehicle, and you can make the roll center as high as you want. In fact, the roll center heights of live axles tends to be about three to four times higher than those of independent suspensions. It's actually quite hard to get a low roll center with a live axle. In summary then, in independent suspensions, to get the jacking forces as low as possible, we want the roll centers to be as low as possible. Let's talk about ride. It may be a bit counterintuitive to think that roll centers affect ride because we've really only been talking about them in terms of cornering, but they definitely do affect ride. Let me explain. Let's look at the tire motion as the suspension moves up and down, and we'll use the swing axle design because it really exaggerates this phenomenon. Imagine the car driving over a rise or yump in the road. The whole body would move up and down on the springs and the suspension would move like this. Watch what is happening at the tire contact patch. Notice how the contact patch is moving side to side and how the two contact patches are moving towards and away from each other. This is called track change and the higher the roll center, the higher the track change as the suspension moves up and down. Now, when the car is moving along the road, the tires really just want to roll forward. 
But now when the car moves up and down over the road bumps, the tires are forced to move sideways by the roll center height. The tires don't want to do that, so they resist this motion, which in turn resists the up and down motion of the body. Unfortunately, good ride means the body needs to be free to move up and down and be controlled by the springs and dampers without being restricted by any resistance from the tires. In contrast, if we go back to our original suspension design, which had a much lower roll center, you can see that while the track change is still there, it is much less. So you can see that the lower the roll center, the less track change there is. In summary then, for good ride, we want to keep the roll centers as low as possible. The third reason we care about roll center heights is for body roll. Let's go back to a diagram to explain how this works. Let's use our previous double wishbone suspension as an example of what happens in a turn. And let's assume that the center of gravity of the vehicle is right here. When a vehicle is in the turn, the mass of the vehicle pushes sideways here at the CG. Again, let's assume that the vehicle is making a left-hand turn, so the mass of the vehicle is pushing outward to the right. As we said earlier, you can think of the suspension instant centers as the point where the suspension acts like a single imaginary link. And since there is a left and a right suspension, the total effect of both instant center is that when the body rolls, it instantaneously rolls about the roll center, which is the intersection of the two roll center lines. This means that in a corner, the mass of the vehicle pushing outward here at the center of gravity, due to the cornering force, is resisted by the left and right suspensions here at the roll center. The difference in height between the roll center and the CG causes a moment to be generated which wants to roll the body to the outside of the turn. Of course, if there was a way of reducing this distance, then the roll moment, or the tendency for the body to roll, would be reduced as well. If we could place the roll center at the same height as the CG, then the distance between the two would be zero and there would be no roll moment at all. In fact, if we could place the roll center above the CG, then the body would roll in the opposite direction and the car would feel like a motorboat. Sounds fun, but remember what we said before about jacking and ride problems with high roll centers. It really isn't practical. Also, we really do need some amount of roll so that we can use things like anti-roll bars and suspension geometry to tune the handling of the vehicle. But that's a topic for another video. In summary then, to help control body roll, we would like the roll centers to be as high as possible within reason. Looking at these three reasons to care about roll center heights, we see two reasons that want the roll centers to be low, jacking and ride, and we see a third reason that wants the roll centers to be higher, the body roll. On balance though, the jacking effect takes precedence and really becomes the factor that dominates this discussion. We must keep jacking under control, and this means relatively low roll centers for independent suspensions. This has the added benefit of being good for ride, but it does mean that we may have a bit more body roll than we would like. Fortunately, we have ways of dealing with that with anti-roll bars and dampers. So, there you have the complete guide to suspension roll centers. I hope you found these videos informative. If you have, click the like button and the subscribe button, and we'll see you in the next Suspensions Explained video.